everybody to today's session on the implications of employing casual staff post the High Court's decision and the recent legislation introduced by the Federal Government. Given today's press in the Australian regarding employing casuals, you'll see that Cadbury's casual employees are threatening to go on their first strike in 40 years as they're wanting to get additional employee entitlements. So if you thought toilet paper was in high demand during COVID, wait for chocolate demand before Christmas if the strike goes ahead. Our presenters today are Alison Baker, an expert in employment law from Paul and Wilcox. Alison's looking to take us through the legislation update and also the implications of the High Court. Alison will be followed by Sharon and Janelle from Shine Wing, who manage our outsourcing division. Sharon and Janelle process a large number of payrolls on behalf of our clients and others. And they've obviously been working to identify issues around casuals and quantify the cost of the new uh, and the financial implications of the new legislation. The presentation, we're aiming for a 35 minute presentation time with 10 minutes of questions at the end. Given that this is a very hot topic at the moment, in the event that we get more questions, we're happy to stay until three o'clock for those who are happy to hang around and, and listen to the questions and go through those. Uh, the session's recorded, so if anybody uh, would like a, a copy of the recording, that's, that's gonna come out tomorrow with a copy of the slideshow. So again, a copy of the slideshow and a copy of the recording will uh, be emailed out tomorrow. All right, we'll kick it off and I'll now hand over to Alison to make a start on her presentation. Thanks very much, Steve, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Steve said, I'm an employment lawyer and the concept of casual employment has really been a hot topic in employment law circles for a couple of years now. Um, until this year, we didn't have a statutory definition of casual employment. So I guess we looked to the common law to get ideas of what is casual employment. And we had sort of a general understanding of what a casual employee looks like. Um, and I've set out on that slide there. So I think we all thought a casual employee would work irregular hours. Um, so there'd be no consistency about what days of the week they worked, how many hours they would work each week and when they would work that um, those hours. And there was no guarantee um, of ongoing work. So it was a very sort of ad hoc arrangement that would be dictated by the operational requirements of the business. So if you had casual employees um, and work would fluctuate, well, you would bring them in as and when you needed them to do their work. And so there was no expectation of ongoing work. They would work one shift and that would essentially be its own contract of employment. And then they might be offered another shift, which would be a further contract of employment. Um, and under legislation, while there was no statutory definition of casual employees, there were certain leave entitlements that would be presented to either just be applicable to permanent employees or also casual employees would have some benefits. So the concept of paid annual leave and paid personal leave are not available to casual employees. Um, in lieu of getting those sorts of entitlements though, they would get or, or do get a casual loading and a casual loading of about 25% on top of the normal ordinary rate for permanent workers. And so that loading is in lieu of getting more permanent type employment entitlements. Um, Casual employees do get some forms of unpaid leave, so unpaid carers leave and un unpaid compassionate leave. But generally speaking, if they need to take a day off, they don't get paid for that. Also, um, if you're looking to terminate the arrangement with a casual employee, you don't have to provide them with any notice. If you compare that to permanent employees who get minimum statutory notice periods under the Fair Work Act for casual employees, you just terminate their employment without notice. Um, important to note though, in a, a situation where you are terminating casual employees, there are other laws that come into play that to pr protect some casuals from unfair dismissals um, and all casual employees can't be unlawfully terminated. So if you're looking to terminate um, employees who are casual, it is important to make sure you, you're doing so consistent with any sort of protections they may have. Uh, and I think in recent times, though, the courts have taken a particular focus on the meaning of the term casual employment. Um, and as a result of some of those decisions, which I'm going to talk to, employers have got extremely nervous, particularly those who engage large casualised workforces. So, you know, employers who are in the education industry or in retail or in hospitality, you know, as a result of some recent decisions, they became very nervous that 
that all of these employees they'd classified as casuals might actually be permanent employees and whether they'd be able to bring claims for permanent entitlements um, and have to pay all this back pay. And um, yeah, there were figures sort of being talked about of back pay underpayments ranging anywhere between sort of 18 billion to 39 billion. So you can understand why that had employers nervous. And those concepts really originate from 2018 when we had um, a full federal court decision that looked at the meaning of casual employment. And that was the decision of WorkPAC and Skeen. Um, WorkPAC is a labour hire company and they engaged Mr Skeen on what they said was a casual basis. Um, initially, he was employed as a truck driver that they put in a mine uh, and he would work sort of a couple of days on and a couple of days off. Um, and then he got a role with them as a dump truck operator for another coal mine uh, and he would work a roster that was 12 months in advance and he would be working seven days on and seven days off. So um, he knew what was expected of him over the next 12 months in terms of when he would be needing to work. So you know, if you think back when I said before, we saw casual employment as sort of irregular hours where you didn't know from one week to the next what you were working, Mr Skeen's arrangement was quite different. Um, he was accused of misconduct, his employment was terminated and following the termination of his employment, he brought the claim against WorkPAC and said, you mischaracterised my employment, um, you called me a casual employee when in fact I was a permanent employee and so on termination I should have been paid out for any annual leave that I had accrued but not taken and obviously he was, because he was a casual, he hadn't taken any annual leave so he was essentially claiming the annual leave for the duration of his employment with WorkPAC. Now, WorkPAC argued um, in the full federal court that Mr Skeen was a casual. Um, they had an enterprise agreement in place that clearly set out the ability for WorkPAC to engage casual employees. They said he got um, an increased hourly rate of pay to reflect that he was engaged as a casual um, and therefore um, the court should find him to be a casual and that he wasn't entitled to annual leave. Uh, Mr Skeen, however, argued that because he had this roster in place, um, it showed that there was a regular pattern of work. Um, he had an ongoing expectation that he would have work for the next 12 months. Um, and so therefore he was not a casual employee. And the full federal court agreed with Mr Skeen and said the concept of casual employment is that there's no firm advance commitment to ongoing employment, but the way WorkPAC had set up his roster, he had a firm advance commitment um, and therefore he was really a permanent employee. So WorkPAC sort of left that case alone, but another WorkPAC employee, Mr Rosato, sort of jumped on uh, where Skeen had left off uh, and said, well, when I was an employee of WorkPAC for four years, between 2014 and 2018, you classified me as a casual, um, but I should have really been a permanent employee. Uh, Mr Rosato argued that he was on a roster. Um, he was on six different contracts. Each of them would have a roster, again, 12 months in advance. Um, he knew when he was working and therefore you couldn't argue that there was unpredictability about his work. And the full federal court agreed with Mr um, Rosato. They essentially affirmed their decision from the scheme case uh, and said that casual employment lacks a firm advance commitment as to the duration of the employee's employment or the days or hours that the employee will work. And they said, when we look at Rosato's employment arrangements, notwithstanding that WorkPAC called him a casual and all of the relevant employment documentation set out that he was a casual, um, he was actually, as they termed it, other than a casual um, because he had this advanced roster in place um, and some certainty about what his hours of work looked like. And they said you know, casual employment has characteristics of being irregular, uncertain, unpredictable, intermittent and a discontinuity in the pattern of work. And those sorts of con concepts weren't consistent with the arrangement that was in place for Mr Rosato. 
Uh, WorkPack had set out some alternative arguments in this case, and I should say it was actually WorkPack that brought it to the full federal court. So Mr Rosato had made the claims to WorkPack and they said, well, rather than um, us get into an argument and have a similar scenario like we did with Mr Skeen, what we're going to do is ask the full federal court to make a declaration that Mr Rosato is a casual employee. And as I said, the, the full federal court didn't do that. They made a de declaration that he was other than a casual employee. So WorkPAC had put forward some alternative arguments in case that was how sort of the cards fell for them. And they said, all right, well, if he's an other than casual employee, we had put a set off clause in his employment contract that essentially said because he was getting this loading as part of his hourly rate of pay, work pack should be able to set off any sort of permanent entitlements that he would get um, based on this loading um, so that he wasn't essentially double dipping. And the court said, well, we don't accept that on the basis to rely on a set of clause in an employment contract. It has to be very carefully drafted and it has to be very specific as to what financial benefit is being provided is set off against other entitlements that may be available to the individual. So because WorkPAC hadn't clearly set out that he was getting paid a 25% casual loading um, and that that was set off against not getting paid for annual leave or paid personal leave or notice of termination, that they couldn't rely on that clause. Uh, and in fact, the way that they had structured his remuneration, he was getting more than what you would get if you were getting paid the minimum rate under the enterprise agreement with a 25% loading. So the court said they couldn't be satisfied that that over above enterprise agreement payment was actually supposed to be a 25% casual loading. So WorkPAC fell down on their set off argument they then looked to the Fair Work regulations and particularly regulation 2.03 um, capital A. Now this regulation had been introduced very quickly by the federal government after the scheme decision to try and avoid a situation of double dipping. So they were very concerned, the federal government after the scheme decision, as were many employers, that all of a sudden there'd be this flood of claims from casuals who were saying they were permanent uh, and employers would find themselves having to pay out permanent entitlements, notwithstanding they'd already paid a casual loading. So the regulation essentially set out that if an uh, employer's paid a, a casual loading in lieu of providing entitlements, then they can't, the employer can't go to a court and say, I want my permanent entitlements as well as getting the loading. So WorkPAC tried to argue they could rely on this new regulation. But again, the court said the way the regulation had been worded wasn't helpful to WorkPAC because Mr Rosato wasn't asking for a payment in lieu. He was actually asking for the entitlement. So he wanted to have been given annual leave, which the court said is not just a financial benefit. There is rest and recreation benefits that come with annual leave. So the court was essentially saying you can't really set off the loading against that ability to have some time off for, from work and to get paid for it. So again, the argument around trying to rely on the Fair Work regulations um, wasn't successful. So then they had one final shot at it in the full federal court and that was arguing a restitution claim. So they said, okay, well then we've made a mistake by characterising Mr Rosato as a casual We've, um, we were in error. And so therefore things should be put in place to reflect what is the, the appropriate outcome. So if he is going to be other than a casual employee and considered a permanent employee, then it's only fair that the loading that was paid to him um, gets paid, uh, gets taken out. And so therefore he's not double dipping. He doesn't get the loading as well as get the entitlements. Uh, and the court said, no, we're not going to accept that argument. Um, we say the parties knew exactly what they were doing in setting the arrangement. Um, you knew you wanted to put in place a roster for 12 months and to set a regular pattern of hours. Um, so there wasn't a mistake. That was exactly what you you're intending to do. So it wasn't a, a great day um, when that decision was handed down for, West, uh, for WorkPAC. What they did do though is appeal to the High Court and the High Court unanimously allowed WorkPAC's appeal. 
uh, and they actually overturned the full federal court decision. So there had been a lot of panic from employers about what Rosato would mean for them. Um, the high court decision, which is a, a very recent decision, it was handed down in early August, um, has, I guess, allayed many of the concerns of employers as to what that meant for them with their casualised workforce. Uh, the High Court, in coming to their decision, uh, looked at the meaning of casual employment. They agreed with the full federal court that a casual employee has no firm advance commitment of ongoing work. So essentially, everybody was working with the same definition of casual employment. But the full federal court had actually looked at the characteristics of the relationship. So what had happened after the parties had entered into an employment agreement and said, really, what that looked like was not casual employment. It looked like permanent employment. The High Court said, um, no, that's not the correct way of interpreting it. What you should look at is the terms and the contract that's entered into at the time that the um, employment relationship starts. So there was an employment contract in place. It clearly said Mr Rosato was going to be a casual employee. It said that there was no guarantee of ongoing work uh, and that, you know, it, it, uh, Workpack could offer employment or could choose not to, and Mr Rosato could choose whether to accept or, or decline any request for him to work on a casual basis. They said the fact that the roster was put in place doesn't mean that it changed the characteristic of the employment. Um, putting the roster in place may have created an expectation from Mr Rosato that he would get ongoing employment, but they said that mere expectation doesn't mean he stopped being a casual employee and became a permanent employee. So look at the terms of the actual employment contract, the express terms of the relationship, and you don't go beyond those express terms. So yeah, a real different approach to what was taken by the full federal court. Now, prior to the High Court handing down their decision, <clears throat> excuse me, the federal government, I guess, were um, you know, trying to get in front of what may happen with the High Court decision, concerned that many employers were going to be faced with significant underpayment um, claims, uh, and particularly in a COVID environment where many businesses were struggling financially, you know, this could be highly problematic for many different industries. And, you know, we have a very large casualised workforce in Australia, so the impact could have been quite significant. So the government in December last year introduced an amending bill to amend the Fair Work Act that dealt with it dealt specifically with the concept of casual employment, and that bill received royal assent on the 26th of March this year. So one of the main things uh, the bill did was to introduce a new definition of casual employee. So as I said at the start, prior to this, we had never had a statutory definition of casual employment and that had created uncertainty. So now under the Fair Work Act, we know what a casual employee looks like. A person is casual if an offer of employment is made to them on the basis of no firm advance commitment to continuing work. Um, if they then accept that offer and then the person becomes employed as a result of the acceptance. And then as part of that definition, we have to drill down to understand what is meant by no firm advance commitment to continuing work. So there's an exhaustive list in the Act that we look towards. So you know, can the employer offer work um, when, it, when it needs to? Can the employee reject that offer? Um, are they described as a casual employee in the employment contract? Um, is it on an ad hoc basis? So if they're needed, they get offered work. If they're not needed, they, they, don't, um, they don't get any sort of work going forward. Um, and also, is there reference to a casual loading? Is there a specific loading in the contract that sets out it's for casual employment? And it's particularly there because um, they're not getting paid other entitlements or benefits that a permanent employee would get. In addition to a definition of casual employment, um, the federal government, I guess, picking up on some amendments the Fair Work Commission had made to modern awards, 
also recognise that over time, casual, employee, casual employment might start to look more like permanent employment. So start to take on the characteristics of being a permanent employee because the work becomes more regular uh, and more predictable. So they introduced this concept of casual conversion rights. So if you have a casual employee who has at least 12 months service, and for the previous six months was working really a regular pattern of work, then employers are required to offer that employee conversion to permanent or the employee themselves can actually request the conversion. So employers now have to be really um, careful to monitor and assess how their casual employees are working. Uh, and once you have a casual who gets to 12 months service, you need to be making sure you're working out whether or not you need to offer casual conversion. Now, as I said, these provisions came in in March. There was essentially a six month transition period for employers, um, but that's about to expire. So on the 27th of September, uh, if you have a casual workforce, you need to have assessed whether or not those casual employees should be offered conversion to, to permanent um, employment because they have a regular pattern of work or have had that for at least six months. There are some exceptions, and that is if you've got reasonable grounds not to offer conversion or to refuse a request. And that includes if the employment you know will cease in the next year, um, or if you think there's going to be a significant change in the hours of work that that person will be required to do in the next 12 months. Um, or similarly, there might be a change in the sorts of days and, and times worked um, that you won't, or that they want that you won't be able to accommodate. Uh, another um, sort of a smaller amendment, but important amendment that came through with the amending legislation is that all employers need to provide a casual employment information statement to their casual employees as soon as practicable after they start. Um, we're obviously all familiar with the Fair Work information statement that you can get from download from the Fair Work Ombudsman's website that you need to give to all employees. This is a new requirement that you need to give to your casual staff and it sets out what the, the new definition of casual employment as well as how casual conversion rights work for employees. So um, again, that's available on the Fair Work Ombudsman's website and, and very important that you're, you're giving that um, information statement to your casual staff. One of the final amendments that came through with the new casual provisions was to ensure that there would be no more double dipping. And as I said, this happened prior to the High Court decision. So it probably doesn't have the same necessity or force as it did prior to the certainty that came with the High Court decision. But it essentially said that if an employee is clearly paid a casual loading uh, and then a court finds them to be a permanent employee, they can't be claiming both an entitlement to the loading as well as the permanent entitlements. There is to be a set off um, provision. So any loading they get can be set off against the entitlement. Um, so they will only get whatever is left over if there is a balance left over. Uh, I've talked a lot about the, the Fair Work Act, but important to understand as well that casual employees may have a long service leave entitlement. I think it's a bit of a misconception that casual employees don't get long service leave. Uh, long service leave entitlements are set up under state and territory, uh, state and territory legislation. So different to um, how we really interact with all of the other workplace relations laws and particularly the Fair Work Act that's set at the federal level and applies a, a, you know, nationwide. Um, with long service leave, you need to look at where your employees are located and what particular act applies to them. I've set out on the next two slides a table that sets out some sort of brief overview information of long service leave entitlements for casual employees. Um, it is a bit difficult to read, but I understand that you're going to get a copy of the slides after the presentation. So it's really there as a bit of a checklist for you. Um, it's not the start and finish of what you need to be aware of. You certainly need to consult with the relevant legislation, but it can be used as a bit of guidance. And Sharon's going to take us through in more detail um, how long service leave applies to casual employees and how you go about calculating it. But important to note that if they meet certain service milestones, they may have an entitlement to long service leave. 
Okay, for me, just to finish up, I just wanted to leave you with some practical tips. So, you know, I've talked a lot about the journey we've been on in the last couple of years with regard to casual employment. Um, from a takeaway perspective, what does that mean for you and your casual workforce? I think, first of all, review all of your casual employment contracts. It's really important to make sure they're consistent with the new Fair Work Act definitions so that you can clearly say they are casual employees because the contract says that they've been giving us a specific um, loading for their casual employment status and uh, it's clear that there's no expectation of ongoing work it's a it's an arrangement that is um, I guess put together based on the operational requirements of the employer and an employee can choose not to accept an offer of casual employment uh, there are also obviously compliance and timeframe requirements with respect to casual conversion. So, uh, and that will be something that will continue. So it, it doesn't just start and finish with the 27th of September. It's an ongoing obligation. So be aware of your requirements there. In terms of record keeping, make sure you're keeping up to date records for your casual staff consistent with fair work requirements. Um, there are significant consequences if you don't do that. There's also a reverse onus under the Act that says if an employer hasn't kept records, there'll be a presumption that they haven't provided the necessary entitlements to the casual employees unless the employer can prove otherwise. Uh, as I said, make sure you provide your casual employee information statement and be aware of what the long service leave entitlements are for your casual workplace. Okay, that's my overview. I'll hand back to Steve. Thanks a lot, Alison. Fantastic overview. And I think that'll give some context to people when they see that Cadbury case on the news tonight and get a sense as to the media blitz that's going to come around casual employees over the next couple of weeks, I think, as it, be, as it starts to implement. We've had a question um, during the period, which we'll answer at the end. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions, feel feel uh, free to put them through the Q&A mode and then we'll get to those at the end. I'll now hand over to Sharon and Janelle to go through some practical examples. Thanks, Steve. Um, so in my presentation, I'm just going to take you through some practical considerations of how we work out those leave entitlements that Alison has explained to us. So once, what's really important, I guess, is um, to have a review your casual workforce and work out what your potential entitlements are for, for those casual employees. So the practical steps would be to basically split your casual employees into two buckets. So your first bucket should have all your casual employees that are subject to conversion because under the Fair Work Act, they're now defined as permanent and they should be going into your permanent headcount. And if they've got any leave entitlements, for annual leave, sick leave, long service leave, you should be quantifying that now at the date of conversion. In your second bucket will be your genuine casual employees and they're the ones that meet the new definitions. Those casual employees won't have any entitlement to annual leave or sick leave because, as Alison mentioned, they are, they're compensated for that with the, the loading that's in their pay rate. However, those casual employees may have an entitlement to long service leave if their service period is defined to be continuous. So what's continuous? So <clears throat> The Long Service Leave Acts, as we know, are state-based legislation, which means that for each employee, you need to look at where they're working and then to see which act they come under. So generally, um, a service period is considered to be continuous if there's no breaks in service. And the breaks in service will generally be three months. But if the, um, in certain states as uh, New South Wales, South Australia, Western Australia and Northern Territory, so everything basically over to the West, they have a break in service of only two months. There were recent changes that came through that said parental leave will no longer be a break in service and that's whether the, the leave is paid or unpaid leave and can go up for two years. So once you've put those employees into their different buckets, you've got your genuine casual employees, how do you work out their long service leave entitlement? Well, the service period for a casual employee is exactly the same as a permanent employee. So if you had a permanent employee and a casual employee starting on the same day, there's no breaks in service, their service period is exactly the same. The difference lies in how we work out the ordinary weekly earnings. 
So if you had a permanent employee, working out their long service leave is relatively simple. You take their weekly earnings and you multiply that by the long service leave accrual. And that accrual is based on one week's pay for every 60 weeks of completed service. That's how it applies in Victoria. But as we know, states have, have different um, accrual entitlements. So you need to look at each acts, each of the different legislations. For the casual employee, it becomes problematic because their pay varies from week to week and sometimes they won't be paid at all. So the way the legislation works around that is they come up with a concept of your average weekly earnings. Your average weekly earnings is actually the higher of the last 52 weeks, one year, the last 260 weeks, five years, or the entire service period if they worked longer than five years. Okay, so let's take a deeper dive now into the meaning of continuous, because this is a really important concept. So as I've mentioned, generally continuous means there's not an absence of more than, than 12 weeks or two months, if you're in those states over to the West, between two any two in instances of employment, unless, and these are important exceptions, the employer and the employee both agree before the start of the absence that it's, um, that there is no, there's no break in service, that the absence is in accordance with the terms of the agreement, that the absence may be caused by seasonal factors, as has been highlighted in the recent action taken by Cadbury's, because their employees have a, a seasonal Easter period. And the last point is important because it says, if the employee has been employed on a regular and systematic basis and has a reasonable expectation of being re-engaged, there's no break in service. But how would we know this? How do you know as an employer that the employee has a reasonable expectation? It's like the boy who was going to call the girl. You know, I expected you to call. You didn't call. Well, we, there's a couple of things that we can do. One is we look at the contract. Um, and so, as Alison mentioned, if the contract provides that work is regular, certain, continuing, constant and predictable, then there is an expectation like Mr. Rosado, that he was going to get a shift next week. However, if the contract says that the work is unpredictable, it's irregular, it's intermittent, and importantly, there's no pre-allocation of work, it's going to more look like it's casual. So the really critical point here is to work out who are your active employees. And so if you've got employees that you haven't engaged for longer than, let's say, the three months, but they're still on your books, it would be in your interest to off-board those employees and make them not active and con that will constitute a break in service. Okay, so to put all this into context, I'm now gonna hand over to Janelle and she's gonna take you through an example. Thank you, Sharon. I'd like to now take us through an example of where a casual employee will meet continuous employment. The facts are Stephanie is employed by Flintstone Business School as a casual exam assessor. She commenced casual employment on the 14th of May 2014 after FBS acquired an unrelated business college where Stephanie had worked as a casual since 28th of November 2009. Stephanie took unpaid maternity leave for a period of 12 months from 1st of July 2013 to 30th of June 2014. Stephanie returned to work on the 1st of July 2014 and was available for marking exams from this date onwards. Stephanie was not allocated any work for 10 months to 1st of April 2015 as a result of a change in the exam cycle. Stephanie received regular work from April 2015 up to March 2020. Since March 2020, Stephanie's marking assignments have significantly reduced due to COVID-19. Stephanie has now requested from FBS for four weeks long service leave to supplement her income. Her leave period is requested to commence from September 2021. Let's look at why Stephanie had a continuous service period. Stephanie has no break in service because her unpaid maternity leave was less than two years. Although Stephanie didn't work for 10 months, Stephanie remained, remained available for work. Prior to her maternity leave, she has been employed on a regular systematic basis and had a reasonable expectation of being re-engaged. FBS retained Stephanie as an active in casual and was not removed from the employment list, meaning there was no off-boarding procedure undertaken with Stephanie. 
How do we calculate long service leave for Stephanie? Well, Stephanie's total service period days are 4,310 days or 11.8 years. Long service leave for this example is calculated at one week for every 60 weeks worked. This will equate to an entitlement of 10.26 weeks for Stephanie. Stephanie will be entitled to four weeks long service leave paid at her ordinary weekly rate of pay at the time the leave is taken. Once Stephanie takes her leave of four weeks, she'll have a remaining balance of at least 60.26 weeks to be taken at a later agreed date or paid out upon termination. Let's quantify the amount for Stephanie. Stephanie's pay is based on her average weekly earnings times the amount of leave taken. As, be, as discussed before, we need to go through the three steps to calculate the highest weekly average earning, the last 52 weeks, the last 260 weeks, and the entire service period. As on the screen, you can see the last 260 weeks has the highest rate of $1,416. What we need to do is take this $1,416 and multiply it by Stephanie's four weeks, which equates to an amount of $5,664, which will be paid to Stephanie. How could FBS, what's a practical remedy the FBS could have undertaken to avoid continuous employment? Well, Stephanie's contract could have been terminated when there was no available work when she returned from maternity leave. She could have actually been re-engaged when the work became available again. Her contract would have recommenced 1st of April 2015 and her service period would be 6.46 years rather than the 11.8. Let's change up the scenario. Let's assume the same facts for Stephanie. And rather than her taking leave, Stephanie's decided to resign and spend some more time with her daughter. The calculation is very similar. Stephanie's highest average weekly earnings is the $1,416 but we do take the 10.26 weeks that she's entitled to, which will equate to a full payment of $14,528 when she leaves on the last day. Had there been a break in service in April 2015, Stephanie's service period would be 6.46 years and no long service leave payout due to Stephanie as she's under the legal entitlement on termination as she'd not completed seven years of continuous service in Victoria. Can you imagine if you had 20 employees like Stephanie, can you imagine what the material amount would be? We've also had some, a couple of clients where they've um, had these liabilities and were totally unaware. What records and actions should employers be taken? You can see from the screen, there's an exhaustive list, but I'll touch on a couple of them. Employers must keep accurate records of employees' long service leave entitlements during the entire period. What's really important here is for employers to look at their payroll systems and calculate the entitlements accurately. It's also very important when a casual employee takes the leave that this is actually recorded in the system as well. Employers need to retain records also for at least seven years after the employment ceases. And there's actually fa failure to keep these records is an offence and penalties can apply. Alison earlier discussed reviewing contracts and updating them. And we should also be looking at all casual employees, employees listing out the continuous service period and calculating their weekly, average weekly earnings. Lastly, we should be quantifying these entitlements and actually booking them in the financial statements. We should also be considering any cash flow effects of this as this, might, this amount might be material. I'd like to now hand back over to Steve, who will go through the Q&A and start wrapping up. Well, thanks a lot, Sharon and Janelle. It was fantastic in explaining how to quantify and identify some of the, the staff from a practical perspective. So we've got six or seven questions. So we might whip through those fairly quickly and try and stay on track for a, a, a finish up in about 10 minutes. So the first one is from uh, just regarding uh, if, if someone is a casual employee and then you offer them part-time and they refuse that and want to remain a casual employee, any idea, any thoughts, Alison, on if someone just refuses to become a casual, a part-time employee? 
Yeah, so that's fine. If that's the case, they stay on as a casual employee. Um, I think it's just important to make sure that when you're going through that process of offering casual conversion and they request, uh, they refuse, I'm sorry, just document it properly. Make sure you're consistent with what you need to do under the Act so that it's clear you're making an offer of conversion under the Act and that it's clear they're rejecting that offer and it's their choice to remain a casual employee. So just really important to make sure you meet all of the criteria so that it doesn't come back um, later on. Thanks, Alice. And the next one, there's a question around if there's any small business exemption where you might only have a few employees um, as to whether or not there's any uh, exemption if you have uh, a minimum number of employees or does this apply across the board? No, there is a small business exemption. So if you're a small business, you don't have to offer the conversion. And do you know what yeah. the, the, the definition of a small business? That's uh, okay. Give me um, a second and I'll... Uh, I'll find I think it. I think it's less than fifteen. I think it would. I mean, that's what generally it is under the mm. Fair Work Act. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, uh, I think we've sort of covered it to some extent, and this is almost the Cabri one, where all the casuals come in at Easter time. They make the Easter eggs, and uh, and they they only come in a couple of months a year, um, and then they're they're not working for the rest of the period. Um, I guess over to. Alison or Sharon, I assume that that would look to be a continuous period of service because there's an expectation that they've worked uh, for the last 15 years as a casual over Easter. Yeah, so if I could just clarify small business employers, the same definition as under the Fair Work Act. Um, yeah, if there's a, re a an expectation of ongoing employment, then um, it won't be a break in service. Happy though, Sharon, for you to add. Yeah, no, I agree, Alison. I, I think it would also come down to what's what's written in the contract and the conduct of the parties. And and so, you know, as I explained, where there's this reasonable expectation of continuing employment and that and that's actually documented in the contract that there is going to be this absence, but they are considered to be active, then you'd say, well, there's an argument to say there's continuous employment. Another quick question is around um, is it this all starts from a particular date. There's no retrospective application um, on, uh, I assume that there'll be re retrospective application on the, the calculation of the period, but it all starts from a particular date as far as entitlements go. For the casual conversion? Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. Um, Say for the fact that the Fair Work Commission did introduce casual conversion requirements in modern awards prior to the legislation. So the the amendment to the Act is now brings it into the National Employment Standards. So it has a greater coverage, whereas the Fair Work Commission had amended modern awards um, some time ago. So there are some employers who were under a situation, they didn't have to offer conversion, but they had to respond to a request for casual conversion from eligible casuals. Yeah. Um, there's another question that says, how about employees that transfer from overseas corporate offices? Will the service years start from the start date of their overseas employer or the date they arrive here? <laughs> do, you want, yeah. do you want me to go? Yeah. <laughs> you go sure. Sure. Um, the, the Long Service Leave actually has a really wide definition of same employer. And if there was common ownership, then you would say, uh, yeah, that service period can go back. And I have actually had a live example of that where I had an Australian subsidiary and a German parent. And um, it was actually also acknowledged when they transferred over into the Australian contract that that prior year service was, was recognised. I think, yeah, from a contractual perspective, certainly if you do that, um, there's been a very recent Court of Appeal Supreme Court decision handed down that has changed everybody's interpretation of what is one employer under the Long Service Leave Act. So prior to this, and it's like August that it was handed down, um, there had been other case law, including the full court of the federal court that said um, that overseas service would count for long service leave purposes. As a result of this recent decision, unless for Victoria in any event or, or specifically, but unless the work that was done overseas was for or, or 
in or of Victoria, so had a real connection to Victoria, it's open to an employer to argue that that service no longer had the requisite connection to make the long service leave legislation apply given its Victorian specific legislation. So um, it's a real changing area of the law as many aspects are in employment, makes it very difficult for employers to know, you know which way to go with things. Um, but yeah, if you've got situations where you've got employees with overseas service coming across, you know, I'd get some advice on if and when long service leave applies to them. And I guess another question that's come through is if, if someone was terminated in 2020 and they were a long-term casual and they're obviously off your books now, there's no financial obligation to go back and pay them, restate the funding? It, yeah, there is. Yeah, so we have a lots of live examples where we've got a casualised um, casualized workforce and the employer might think, well, the, you, you're not on my books. And they'll say, but I, I worked with you for, for 10 years and they have a claim. And so we've had lots of situations where employers are voluntarily, um, so that they either pay out when the employee makes a request or sometimes now they can see that there's a pattern happening and rather than creating the, the tidal wave, um, they've actually gone to those employees and say, yes, you've got long service leave and they've, they've, they've paid them out. So yeah, it can be retrospective. Alison, did you have any comments? Just that there'll be, yeah, there's a limitations period. So employees have got six years to make that claim. Right. So, and, and that reinforces the need to keep really good records because if you have somebody turn up six years later uh, and, and yeah, they're a casual employee, you, you, know, you want to make sure you've got the records to be able to put forward, you know, work out what your position is. And if you want to decline the entitlement, make sure you've got good grounds to do that with your records. Another question coming through is obviously COVID has, has turned off a lot of casuals in the last three or four months or 12 months if you're in Victoria. Um, so there's just not much service there. Uh, is there any sort of COVID um, theories there that did, is there any chance that COVID itself could break that, that period or is there, does there have to be something in writing there that literally takes them off the payroll and terminates them to allow that, that period of service to cease? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you would definitely have to go through a process of explaining to the person that um, they're no longer required. Yep. So you're terminating their employment um, or, or look at the particular Long Service Leave Act and work out whether or not it amounts to a break in service. But it, otherwise it will essentially be seen as a stand down. So there's just no work for them to do in that time. No worries. Well, I think that's, we might just give it another two seconds. If, uh, um, I can't, have you guys got the questions as well? I can't see that. I think we've covered most of the questions in one way or another. Do we have to, during COVID lockdown, do they have, yes, they do have to terminate a casual during lockdown. Um, the other one is if there's regular employment of a roster is done around someone uh, around a university timetable, so they are not refusing shifts as they are offered shifts around the timetable on each semester. So again, I think it's at some point if if people are rejecting shifts, uh, I guess it comes back to that same point that you have to terminate them rather than just leave them sitting on as a an active participant. Um, I know a lot of university and education clients that I've got have long lists of potential um, casual employees to do marking and, and other sorts of activities. Um, I, I guess the message is that you really need to take active steps to try and get them off your payroll or terminate them rather than just have them sitting there um, on a long-term basis. Yeah, depending on, as Sharon said, the terms of the employment contract. So I think yeah. it's a package. Um, so set out, if you know in advance that there's going to be breaks in service and what that means, make sure it's properly set out in the contract to see if you've got arguments to say there has been a break in um, continuity continuity of service. So, so I, I missed that small business. Someone just asked, is the minimum 15 employees for that small business exemption? That's right. Yeah, so it, it is. is 15 employees yep. for the small business exemption. So less than that, um, you're, you'll be eligible for that small business exemption. Um, do normal long costs apply to long service leave payouts? So I assume the normal payroll tax and the other on costs would apply to those, including um, what 
might be super on cost. Is superannuation applied to those costs, Sharon? No. So uh, termination pay, yeah. So it's not an exempt, it's not an exempt uh, remuneration for payroll tax and work cover. Um, so the only ones that are generally exempt are bona fide redundancies for payroll tax purposes. Um, in relation to super, super is paid on long service leave that's actually taken and annual leave. But if it's a termination pay, it's specifically exempt under the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act. All right. If you're taking over a business, Alison, uh, and you inherit a whole lot of casuals, does, does their um, start date start at zero or do you inherit the, uh, the prior service? Yeah, you'll in, in most cases, look, it'll depend on the, the nature of the transaction, but uh, in some cases, certainly you could inherit their length of service. So you need to be mindful of that when you're negotiating your terms. Hmm. And is, have any bodies sort of released, another question is, has any bodies released any template agreements or preferred um, documentation that they believe is aligned with the law or is it is the law still so young that everybody's still trying to work out the methodology around how you do terminate and create some sort of HR template agreements? Uh, there might be some information on the Fair Work Ombudsman site. They do have template documents, but... Um... Yeah, otherwise, I think, and, and any document like that needs to be tailored for the particular workplace and the particular employee. So you should also always be really careful about just grabbing a template off a, you know, a website, and you know, whether it's fit for the actual for purpose, purpose that you need it for. Yeah. Another quick one on the small business, because obviously that's a, a sensitive one. If someone goes over 15 um, at some point, are you, are you a small business up until the point of 15? And then uh, is there much law around... Um, how you transition out of small business into into out of those exemptions? I think as soon as you hit the headcount over 15, you're no longer a small business. There's no transition with that. And it's really yeah. relevant as well, without going on to another topic, but around unfair dismissal, um, qualifying periods and, and things like that. So it has, it has a role to play and severance payments. So if you're a small business on a redundancy, you're not having to pay severance payments. As soon as you go above 15, that changes and you, you become an, an, a normal employer under the Fair Work Act without the privileges that a small business gets. I guess the, the last, that there's a lot of COVID questions around the, the anomaly around COVID where full-timers and part-timers have essentially stood down from their job and they're using casuals. Um, and I guess uh, the, the question's gonna be around whether those casuals must convert or, or are offered to convert to part-time or full-time. And I think you just mentioned earlier, Alison, that you really, if, if they reject that, then really you have to get that in writing from them to highlight you made the offer and they've rejected it. And if you don't, if they're, they're not putting things in writing, then I would still have a paper trail. So to say, well, you haven't responded, you've told us you don't want it, you haven't responded as required by the process under the Fair Work Act, we're taking what you've done as a rejection. Um, so just have a good paper trail so that if you're challenged in the future, you can say we followed all the steps and we can't make the person do things, but we followed every step that we were supposed to, to try and ensure we complied with the law. No worries. I think that just about wraps up the questions. Uh, so let me thank the speakers. Let me thank Alison, Sharon and, and Janelle and our team at Chime Wing for uh, organising the event. Um, thanks again for everybody joining. Have a great afternoon. Um, if there's any other questions, feel free to email the participants. So tomorrow you'll end up getting a, an email, the slideshow, also a link to the recording. Uh, you'll have the details of the speakers, um, email addresses in those uh, in that email and feel free to, to uh, follow them up with any additional questions. Again, thanks for joining and, and hopefully we'll uh, see each other face to face at some stage soon. Have a great afternoon, everybody.